And uh, it, is, it is tremendous what just took place here today. I hope you, just by example, get to, to have a little bit of an understanding of my purpose and why I'm here and what I'm doing here as a bishop. This was, and as I've been teaching over the past couple of years here, and especially recently regarding partnership with the Holy Spirit, fellowshipping with him, the importance of the Holy Spirit. What you saw this morning does a bishop's heart uh, very good. It's joyous to see baby steps taking place. And the things that I train bishops, pastors, rabbis, and priests all over the world to do. And I want to, first of all, give us several scriptures. And we'll be done in within 15 minutes. But you need to hear what I'm, what I'm about to say to you. And then I will continue to teach tonight. It excited my spirit, satisfied my spirit this morning to see what the Spirit of God was doing. Now, it's important that you hear what I have to hear and not box it into religion. First of all, I want to honor our pastors this morning. Would you put up scriptures from Matthew chapter 5? Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Um, I'll go to the exact reference there. In Matthew chapter 5, verses start at verse 13. We'll do verses 13 through 17. And I'm not going to teach on this right now. I just, just want to bring this across. <clears throat> Please read it with me. Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? If it thenceforth goeth forth nothing, I'm sorry, it is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Verse 14 says, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth a light unto all that are in the house. I want to thank our pastors, pastors Larry and Linda, and 51 years of marriage, and the, they've been a light. They have been salt. They have, salt creates thirst. Salt is a preservative. Salt is used to heal. They have been salt to many, and they have been a light to many, and they still are, both of those things. And so I want to acknowledge that at all the years of their marriage and then all their years here in the ministry, they have been effective, you have been effective for the kingdom of God. And that is no light thing. And, and the people here, all the people know that. They know it. But it's so important to just echo that reality and the value of that. We all know it, but we really None of us really know it. None of us really know the true depth of that value that God has blessed the body with, with the two of you. It's incredible. It's beyond what we know. And actually, it's beyond what you know. Hallelujah. It's, it's just a deep blessing. It's in you. The, the light is in you. The light of the world is in you. And you are light, and you are salt in the earth. And you're continuing regardless of situations, circumstances, good or bad, or in between, <laughs> you're just perpetual in this. So thank you. Thank you so much for being this witness and being this light. Hallelujah. It's been great. Would you all echo that? Yes, yes indeed. Now I want to take us to another passage of Scripture. First of all, your theme Scripture today uh, for the month, Mark 16, 18, and I've taught on part of this, but I didn't go as in depth on it, and I'm not going to teach on it now. Once again, I'm summarizing, echoing some things in reference to what took place here 
this morning in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 18. Would you read that with me? They shall take up serpents. Actually, let's back up a couple of verses where it says, These signs shall follow them that believe. Verse 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, there's a lot in there to unpack, but I'm not teaching on that. Just to remind us of one of the Greek words I brought out to us in the past few, last few times that I was here, and uh, in the past week or so, as well in regards to this. The word there, sick, is the word arostas in the Greek. That is the type of sickness that you recover from. And in the body of Christ as a bishop, I'm teaching on these ver various things for the body of Christ to grow, to expand, to mature. So when we are praying and believing God, when we're doing that, we know exactly what we're praying for. We know exactly what results to expect, and we don't get it confused. And so it's, we're at a stage in the body of Christ now where God is teaching us how to get results and to be more effective and at the same time be less discouraged. And so this word here, arostos, for sick, there are so many, I could read the whole thing in Greek, but here, arostos for sick, that's the type of illness that you recover from. Now, if you're looking at, now, and uh, so this morning, Rochelle mentioned the woman with the issue of blood. That's a whole different category of illness. Aristos is a whole category of illness, uh, illnesses. But the, what she talked about, the woman with the issue of blood, that's mastigas in the Greek. That's the kind of illness that there is no medical cure for. There is no known cure no, no, no cure known to man regarding that. That's something that it doesn't matter how many physicians you see, it's in a whole class of sicknesses and diseases. Doesn't matter how many specialists you see, they may help to slow something down a little bit, but they cannot cure it. It's incurable by mankind. It doesn't matter what science comes up with over the decades or what have you, th this is a type, a category of illnesses that no man or there's no natural cure for. And this is a category of illnesses and sicknesses that Jesus healed and that we as the people of God can be used of God to bring healing. That's why when I say things, I'm not just preaching on the surface. When I say there should come a time when people are passing the hospitals and coming to the churches to be healed, and when doctors, along with the consent of, well, with the consent of family members and so forth, are bringing patients, certain types of patients, to the churches who are trained in areas like this, where the people can get healed because no medical profession can bring that type of healing, no human being can. It can only happen in partnership with the Holy Spirit. That's the only way it can happen. That is a biblical, a scriptural category of healing. And throughout history, throughout the history of mankind, there are certain sicknesses and diseases that man has never found a cure for. Never. But God has healed people in those areas. And so that's another area. Now let's go, and, and that's why, let me say this, that's why, let's go to Psalm chapter 51. I'll share just these few scriptures. This is just, once again, a reminder. I'm reminding you of why God has me as the bishop here. I'll come, and I don't always preach and scream and yell. I can do all of that but I teach us why, because that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in these days. 
You see, they, there's a time for shouting, but there's, a, there's also a time to follow the specific instructions of God. Because you can shout loud and get results, but other times you can shout and scream and pray and praise and shouting and get no results because it's us and not the Spirit of God. It's just tradition. We were talking about that the other, just the other day, going someplace, you know, and you just, you don't feel it. You, just, you don't want to just shout because, make noise because everybody's making noise, but you want to when the Spirit of God is directing. They marched around the wall of Jericho seven days. They were quiet. They followed the instructions. The shout came after seven days of silence. That's when the wall came down. What if they had shouted on day one and, and had a revival every day? The wall would have still been up. They had to follow the instructions that God gave. They had to follow the word of the Lord. And when it was time to shout, they got the results. But there is a time to be taught, to be trained, to go through apprenticeship. And in that apprenticeship, you start getting results. This morning was a part of apprenticeship. The things that were happening here, or the things that I've been talking about and teaching about, that we are now in a different era. There was a time when God used people in a certain era to do certain things. I was there during that, those, that era when, when they were doing it. I was there when Catherine Kuhlman would have healing lines for hours. I was around and there and many times when Oral Roberts would have healing lines for hours. I've stood in partnership with Richard Roberts where we have had healing lines for hours together. I've been there when Benny Hinn has had healing lines for hours. It's Benny Hinn's spiritual father. I'm on his national board. He's a good friend, and I'm, a, I'm a, a, an encourager to him and so forth. Uh, with, and that's with Benny Hinn's spiritual father and John R. Knott's spiritual father, Dr. Tommy Reed, out of Archer Park, New York. Mighty men and women of God. Amy McPherson, before Catherine Kuhlman. Brother Eptigrobe, R. W. Schembach, who both were with A. A. Allen. They all had the healing lines and ministered, and people would come, and they would line up for hours. These men and women got results. But that was an error that God, God used. But for the body of Christ, that's, that error has passed. And if we try to hang on to it, that's all we'll get. People will still sit in the pews and remain babies and get a miracle every once in a while as they wait long enough for a man of God to lay his hands on or a woman of God and to pray for them or to have a word of knowledge. And that's all it will get. That's what Moses did. And then Moses' father-in-law came to him and said, what you're doing is not good. It's not wise. Yes, you're getting results, but if you keep on doing it this way, you're going to wear yourself out and wear these people out. Moses sat there all day long up into the night, listening to the people and ministering to the people one at a time. How do you do that with somewhere between two and a half and three million people? His father-in-law, Jethro, came and he said, what you're doing is not wise. It was a good thing on the surface, but not good for Moses or the people. He would have no family time. He, would have, he wouldn't have time just to spend with the Father, spend time with God. Because he's always taking care of the needs of the people. He said, this is how you govern these people. You set aside faithful people who can train others, set them aside as uh, people and, and train them and have them as rulers, people who are trained as rulers or as overseers of tens, of fifties, of hundreds, 
and of thousands. And the ministry would be effective. Jesus had a pattern like that. He had the disciples with him. He didn't just go out and hold big meetings and do it all by himself. The entirety of his ministry, his earthly ministry, from day one, he looked for somebody to train. And all of, the disciples, all of the disciples were not with him at the same time. But over a short period, period of time, he gathered the 12 and then the 72 and so on and so on. But he trained them. And when he fed 5,000 people more than once, plus the women and children, that is 5,000 plus women and children, he break the bread, put it in the disciples' hands. The bread multiplied from their hands to the people. It was a partnership. Jesus did not intend to stay here forever in his physical body and minister to the people. He intended to train people who would be here in physical bodies to do that, to do the things that he did and then greater things than he did. And then he said, this is how you will do it. I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. The Father is sending the Holy Spirit. And if you partner with the Holy Spirit, after he has empowered you, endued you with power, he's filled you, he's baptized you, he's filled you, he's endued you with power, now he's going to partner with you. He's not only going to be in you, he's going to be with you. He's with you and he's going to be in you. He's in you and he's going to be with you. As he's in you, he will strengthen you to withstand all the forces of the enemy. But as he is with you, the ministry of the kingdom of God will go forth. The Holy Spirit, there are many things he's ready to do, but he will not do. The Holy Spirit can do anything, all that Christ has done, but he will not do it, even though he can. There are a number of things the Holy Spirit will not do, even though he can do them. You know why he won't do them? He won't do them unless he has cooperation with us, with people. There are many things we cannot do without the Holy Spirit. But there are many things the Holy Spirit, although he can do, he will not do without us. And we know that we can do nothing without Christ, according to, Col to John chapter 15. That is nothing spiritual that's going to carry on. In fact, we can't, in fact, we can't even breathe without him. But Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father as an intercessor for us. The Holy Spirit is here now as an intercessor for us. And so that's <clears throat> Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Let's go there real quick. I'm going to stop in a couple of minutes. Let's do this Romans 8, 26. We're looking at this word here regarding aristos, sickness. is the kind of disease that you can recover from. But Romans chapter 8, verse 26 Please read it with me. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself, it says in the Greek, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It says here, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Two Greek words here. The word infirmities is the word Aristos. That's a, the general word for all sicknesses, diseases of every kind, every category, all weaknesses, discomforts, whether it's in the soul, in the physical body, or in the spirit. This is a word like if you would use the word sick. Somebody would come to you and say, well, you pray for my child. My child is sick. Well, the child may be sick with cancer. It may be a cold. It may be a sinus situation. But all you said was, my child is sick. It, but sickness, the word sick, covers all of that. That's a general word. Oh, disease. This person has a disease. Well, there are many things that are diseases. So it, it's a general, this is a general, general word. The word, the Greek word arostos, is talking specifically about a type of sickness that, uh, I'm sorry, that you recover from. But the word asthenios, 
is talking about every type of sickness and disease. Also, it covers trouble, a troubled soul, problems in the home, problems, relationships with people and things like that. And Jesus made it clear that the Holy Spirit would come and he would help us. He says this, he will help our infirmities. This is the same word that's used in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when Paul said, in his infirmity, he sought the Lord three times to remove it. And each time the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Some versions will translate it weakness. Some would translate it as infirmities. They have different words, but it was that thorn in the flesh with Paul. That was a general word for sickness that Paul was dealing with. But what the Lord said to him was this. He said, my favor, my charis, my grace is sufficient. This wasn't like many denominations have taught that it was something Paul was to bear and it was his cross to bear. No, charis is the same word that gives us all the gifts of the spirit, all the gifts of healing, all the gifts of powers or miracles is all the way through, whether we're dealing with motivational gifts, manifestation gifts, ministry office gifts, even, and it's not something that is separated by testaments. People will say the Old Testament is law, the New Testament is grace. There were laws in the Old Testament. I've taught on why they were there, just like parents have rules in their home. The ministry of the Father greatly took place in the Old Testament. Then there was an era for the ministry of the Son. Now we're in the ministry of the Holy Spirit who's to be with us forever. And so the Old Testament is for believers when you become a child of God. Not a son, not a mature son, but a child of God is there to train us up, to teach us rules, regulations, just like you taught your children when they were growing up. A bedtime, you had time for them to eat, you had rules and so forth, so they would learn why. Because eventually they will function as adults and they would rule over much. Jesus said, a child is no different from a slave or servant, though when he's under schoolmasters, though he be Lord, King James says, though he be Lord of everything, though he is Lord of everything, he owns it all. When he's a child, there's no difference between him and the servant in the house. The Old Testament prepares us to receive and walk in the fullness of what Christ has legally provided for us. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And we've allowed religion to brainwash us with things that are not true. Like the, all the Old Testament is this law and we should ignore it now that we're in Christ. That's like telling a two-year-old, act like a 21-year-old. We have all of this in Christ. He purchased it back for us, all that Adam and Eve lost. But Every child of God is not ready to move in it at an adult level. We have to go through tutorship. We have to go through the training. We have to have parents. Our Heavenly Father is over us, but we have to have tutors and so forth and governors and governesses in our lives to train us and develop us. That's what the Old Testament is about. If you p ignore it, you've ignored almost 90, over 95%, that is, of the New Testament and we'll get flaky and not understand it and live from experience to experience and never grow up. So it's there for us to learn what we are to move in total freedom and governance over. There comes a time when you receive the inheritance and you walk in the fullness of it. As an adult, when you get your inheritance, from relatives, what have you, you own it all. You, can, you have the freedom to do a lot with it. Likewise is the case when we grow up spiritually. So what you saw this morning, and I'll conclude with this part, even though I won't get to Psalm 51, what you saw this morning here is what I train. That's why I have School of the Holy Spirit in Saginaw with ministers and pastors and others coming from all around that area and some other states coming in for that. Because my mission is to not just go out 
I've done it in the past, but with the massive crowds and just hold a revival service and hold a camp meeting and a brush harbor meeting so people, you know, it, all of those are good that we have, but when you have it, the focus is on one person and you wait to get that person back again. Then you have another meeting. Then you wait to get somebody like that person back another time. That's great. We need all of that because we have people on all different levels, children growing up spiritually. But the body of Christ at large is supposed to get past that. Isn't it something? You're not wearing the same clothes you wore when you were five. You've outgrown them. There's some things the churches are still doing that's fitting for certain maturity levels in the church. But when the whole church is doing it, somebody in there should have outgrown those things. See, you see what I'm saying? And go on to other levels. So the church in general now, Brother Updegrove is not here. It's why? Because it's not just how long the man lived. That era of ministry, God is moving us into another phase of ministry. Many of you were around with Brother Updegrove, powerful man of God, used of God all over. Your pastors wouldn't be saved without God using that man. The, the revival at Liberty and so on. You could say the same thing about Oral Roberts, Billy Graham, and others. But you remember that one name. But what I've been teaching and training us to do and moving us into the baby steps of is what happened this morning when it's not just one person or one speaker but it starts to happen with everybody. So what would happen at, with one person at a revival can happen anywhere you go because it's deposited in you and we're each individually trained to do it. Revival can break out, it can happen at any moment in time in any meeting, regardless of who's present because everybody's equipped and ready to be used of the Holy Spirit and will partner with the Holy Spirit. How God used Rochelle this morning how God used Brian this morning, how God used, of course, seasoned Pastor Linda, she's seasoned, and then Linda, Sister Linda, and others follow to minister around the altar this morning without anybody giving a formal <laughs> invitation for that to happen. It was a breakout of the Holy Spirit, and there were people who were ready to be used of the Spirit of God. I come to train everybody to do that. I take time to do it. Sometimes it's longer than your regular service. Why? Because it's the training is what you get before you go out, you, before you become effective. One final thing with this. When people go to college and university, and a number of us have done that, some of us have gone there for a, a ridiculous amount of years. But when you do that, you don't go to a college or university to leave your dorm or your, your apartment, what have you, five days a week or what have you, to go to an auditorium to hear someone get up and pump you up, get you excited and enthused. You don't go to be preached at. You don't go to the classroom at the university to be preached at. As important as it, as it is to have those gatherings and have special meetings and assemblies and things where people are encouraged. It's important and e even vital. But you don't pay all that money to go to a university every year to go to some kind of auditorium with the masses to sit in there and hear an exciting uh, person up front preaching and giving you some flowery words. You go there to be taught. You go there to be trained your degree doesn't come from the preaching, it comes from the teaching and the tests and so forth regarding that. If you look at the life of Jesus with his disciples, Jesus preached and taught, and he tells us both to do that. Mark 16, we're to preach. Matthew 28, we're to teach the gospel to the whole world, make disciples. He taught, and you see the masses, and he taught them. And they got used to miracles, and they followed him for miracles or for food or what have you. But there was no depth to them. But the ones he taught on a daily basis are the ones who carried on the ministry. Those who were the Talmud, Talmudim, Talmudot, the men and women disciples. 
They learned from the teachings. They enjoyed the preaching, but the preaching did not mature them. The preaching encouraged them and stimulated them in between the teaching sessions to keep them going, to keep them motivated. But if all they got or if the majority was t preaching, they would not have been effective when Jesus left. And what they would face after he left, and they had to tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit who would continue that teaching, Jesus said, he would teach you all things, not preach, and bring to your remembrance all that I have said unto you. So in the body of Christ, we have to embrace the teaching, embrace the discipline, the apprenticeship where you go through training sessions, where you see s small miracles happening and powers happening. Just yesterday, a lady was telling me a couple of people in, in Saginaw about what's happened when they start laying hands on people. One lady, Grace, laid hands on her husband. She kept doing it when he was asleep and what have you, had this, gross on his, this growth on his ear and it was there and she, I, I told them last week in the School of the Holy Spirit, you know, as they're taking these baby steps for miraculous powers of God to work, that, that this week some of them would have testimonies of those baby steps and don't overlook those baby steps. Before they're looking for these, expecting these giant things to happen immediately, get some training, developing, just like in medicine you go through school, you go through internship, you go through residency, you, you, you take on a specialist, you, you get trained, you have apprenticeship. You have the same MD on your wall when you graduate that you do, that you do 30 years later. The difference is experience, training, and development. Someone comes out and they, they're saying, I'm qualified because um, I'm an MD and I'm, I'm going into a specialist. Can you imagine, it, it doesn't happen this way, but can you imagine somebody becoming a cardio surgeon or, a, 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 you know, or a, a, or a neurosurgeon either? And they, they decide that they're going to operate on you because you need surgery. And you ask them, how many people have you ever operated on? They would say, not a single one. I've observed a couple surgeries, but I've never operated. Now, who would you choose? Would you choose that person to operate on you or the person who says, oh, yeah, I've uh, successfully operated on 5,000? Yes, because one has gone through training, not just teaching, but actually the experience of training, trial and error, being there, being mentored, being coached along, going through a lot of training and steps, a lot of discipline to get to that point. Well, the body of Christ enjoys the preaching and the running around and shouting, but we get bored with the teaching and then the hands-on training where every individual is to be trained and grow up to do the same thing Brother Uptegrove did. Everyone is supposed to do that. Every individual is supposed to do what our Oral Roberts did or Catherine Kuhlman. Not just them, not just me, but all of us, and we won't do those things in the body of Christ unless we are trained and we are developed and we go through apprenticeship and we go through exercises over and over and over again to get there so that when it's time to shout, the wall will come down. Are you hearing me? So I have effective strategies that I use all over the world and get results. And so there's a method and a strategy to everything I do. When I come here, if I take extra time, and if you, you let the small, what seems like small talk fall between the cracks, you've just missed something very powerful and effective. Because if you take that every word and you, and you take it and you begin to utilize that, even set aside things, put it on the shelf, if it's not for now, God will manifest things through our lives. There's something meaningful behind everything I come here and tell you. Even if I'm joking, I have a strategy and a meaning in it. I don't just come and do anything. I'm a bishop. I'm not a novice pastor. I'm not a lay minister. I'm a bishop's bishop. So when I come here, I really do have something to say and something to impart so that it makes the difference five years from now 
the difference is experience felt and seen by people who have never seen me, but they are in touch with you. See, that's the kind of thing. So if you expect me to just come and be another brother up to Grove, you'll be greatly disappointed. I can do that. I'm trained to do that. He was trained to do that, but he was trained to do a lot more than that too. But he had to stick with what the people were able to receive. You know that man had a lot more in him than he was able to give out because he had to deal with the people on the level the people were on. And so God is taking us to other levels of growth and maturity where we're not just sitting and doing the same things we did 10 years ago. Everybody is trained. And the new people, the babies that come in, are the ones that are sitting to be trained. And they're learning from watching you, just like children do. And if they don't see the more mature ones moving out with people recovering from sicknesses and disease and with miracles happening and limbs straightening out and fingers straightening out and things of that nature, growths coming off of people, boils off of their, their, their bodies and, and, you know, and cancer coming out of them. If they don't see that happening, then they just think a few people like an Oral Roberts are the ones that God, those are the only ones God uses to do it. Or maybe God will move on your pastor to do it, and that's it. Not realizing that everything Jesus did, he said every believer is to be able to do that. Finally, the Holy Spirit, now see this, Jesus did not just simply come to do things for us and then to show us what God could do. If we think that we're missing the purpose of his ministry, he did not come for us to just see what God could do and to watch God do things and to call on God to do things all the time. That's what toddlers do. He came to show us what man could do when man partnered with God, when man submitted to God. And so everything he did, he did, he did it in partnership with the Father. What he heard, he spoke. What he, what he was told to do, he did it. And he did that to show us, and he didn't do it as God. He didn't use his deity to do it. He did that to show us that everything he did any man or woman could do if they submitted to God, if they cooperated with the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't come here to show us what God could do. He came here to show us that when we're born again, what mankind could do in submission to God, if they would just cooperate with God. It's not about what God does. God could rule everything, but he put man here to dominate the planet. And God wanted to work with us, not only in us, but with us. Oh, see, we resigned it. God worked in me and through me, and it's just Jesus doing everything. No, Jesus doesn't just want to do everything. He has empowered us, equipped us, and he said, now I'll cooperate with you via the Holy Spirit, and together I'll work with you, and we'll get things done. That is why there are many things the Holy Spirit will not do without you. There are some things that if he can't get you in specifically, individually, to cooperate, it won't happen. There are things that have not happened in our family lineage from generation to generation. Why? Because even 10 years back, family members didn't cooperate with the Holy Spirit on certain things. Today, those same things that are, facing, that are in the family for that family unit, that family line to do, maybe one or two will branch out and cooperate with the Holy Spirit but whole dynasties of, of operations from God that would happen like it did through Noah and his family, it's supposed to happen through family units and family lineages, never happens because people won't cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not do it without that family. And as we mature, we recognize there, just like many things don't happen in your family if people don't cooperate to do them. Same thing happens in God's family with family units. It doesn't happen. Uh, and it's not like God is just going to go find somebody else. No, there are some things that's not going to happen. If you don't do it, they, it won't get done because it's not simply up to the Holy Spirit to do them. It's a partnership. 
That's why some people can be in a service and get excited and when the spirit is moving and minister and cooperate and others will sit there because here they don't feel anything. They're waiting to be moved by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is saying, no, I don't want to move you. I want to partner with you. If you move, I'm ready to move. It's the moment you move, I'll move with you. If you sit there and don't move, I won't move. And we'll take that to say that the Holy Spirit is not present. When he's saying, no, you're not activating yet the partnership. And so I'm here to teach us and to train us, and I'm qualified to do it, how to grow up and mature and not just settle for the things we settled for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years ago, 50 years, 70, 80 years ago, five years ago, but how to mature and have every individual Whatever God uses me to do at that level, every individual can do it and beyond that because we are all to do what Jesus did and then do greater things. And so I was so thrilled with that, how God moved in that. Hallelujah. Now still in things like that, training has to go into more and more into that, how to, how to flow with the Holy Spirit and how you're not um, quenching the Holy Spirit when you follow order, the Holy Spirit does certain things in certain ways, and you can still pick up and go on with the order. won't hurt him at all because he's, he submits to the order of Christ. Remember that. He's with Christ, but the fivefold ministry, that's order. So we learn and we develop all of that as we go along and know how to flow and how to function that way. That's what I wanted to say this morning, and I'm so thrilled and so happy with what God has done. But if you're here and you come out for what seems sometimes like dry sessions for you, I'm here for you. At least you can make the effort to get here and get something that will really bless you and your family for decades if you take it to heart. Because I can preach at any moment in time. The Holy Spirit could move in the miraculous at any moment in time. I can do exactly what Oral Roberts or Catherine Kuhlman did. I've done it before God has used me to raise the dead before. None of that is foreign to me. I've moved in all of that, not just a once in a while thing, but I have a lifestyle of, of that kind of ministry and so forth. But I also have been called of God and trained to teach. I was born for this. We're all unique in different ways, but God brought me into the earth for this person. And I know I'm a different type of individual, not a weird type of individual. I'm a different type of individual because of what God, the assignment. He told my parents before they even conceived me that they were going to have me and what I would do. And so I know it's not a normal thing for anybody to get nine doctoral degrees. I know that, you know, and that's not something academics, and that's since academia means nothing without the Holy Spirit. Every one of those are in connection to the leading and guidance and cooperation the leading of the Holy Spirit, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in cooperation with him. Not a single one is simply for an independent career. It's all designed by God for purpose. I know that. So my whole life from my earliest memory has been about him and then formally giving my heart to him at a very early age and never finding those wild oats that people said, one day you will backslide, you'll fall away, especially as a teenager. It didn't happen. And I'm a living witness and proof that you can live for God all your life and you never have to fall away. And, I, and, and today I, I know that, that, may, that may make me look strange to people, but that's how it's been my life. And I've been serious about God. So whenever the world is faced with whatever crisis, I don't move in the same direction of the world. I don't just get up and shoot out, shoot out hot air. I mean what I say because I live it. I don't run from sickness or disease. I move toward it. Just like Jesus did. But I don't do it simply as a human being on my own. I do it in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Are you listening to me? And I do it in obedience to the Holy Spirit. I mean, you don't just walk up to a cobra just because you're saved. But if you happen to be in a room with it, you have already predetermined that if you're in the room with danger and in the natural, that danger is more powerful than you, that you're going to be more powerful that for, 
uh, more powerful than that danger. Why? Because you are with the Holy Spirit. And when we understand that, we understand that there are things the Holy Spirit can do that will cause even things that are bigger than us to, to be destroyed by us, such as a 17-year-old boy with a bear and with a lion called David. And he fought a giant, a grown man, and defeated him. But this is the same David who said in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thine Holy Spirit from me. And Catherine Kuhlman used to quote that over and over again behind stage before she would come out and God would just move. She didn't have to lay hands on people. That was after the miracles happened. They'd come up She'd acknowledge that and lay hands and they'd fall out. They weren't healed when they fell out. They were healed in their seats. Some of them were outside and they were just healed outside because of the presence of God. That's how it's supposed to work. But can you imagine thousands of people waiting in line and all those Christians, instead of waiting, any Christian in that line that was mature, the presence of God on them should have been able to heal somebody next to them or around them instead of them waiting for hours for one person. So when we have a meeting, in five minutes, everybody could be ministered to if people would turn around and minister to one another and expect the same results as if I laid my hands on them or some other man or woman of God did the same thing. We'd all do it together and get the results. So let's stand. Hallelujah. So I'm here to do those kinds of things. My heart is just thrilled about what happened. I'd love to, that's the result of teaching and training. I see it happening all the time in Saginaw and in many other places. It's happening here because your pet is no stranger to you. It's not strange to your pastors. They've been moving in this for decades. But a lot of us have been sitting and not moving in it. And it's not a criticism on us. It's just saying there's more for us. Take the time to get the discipline of training and practice so that we're moving in it. Baby steps. Grace, with her husband, laid hands on him, and so forth. He had this growth, this growth, excuse me, on his ear had gotten big. The doctors were planning to do surgery um, tomorrow, I believe it was. But earlier this past week, we had class on Monday, I think it was around Wednesday. Her husband was working in his garage, and it just happened to rub his hand by his ear, and the growth fell off on the floor. So she called the doctor, and he said, well, have him come in. And the doctor he had him come in and he looked at it and said, yeah, well, they don't have to do that surgery. It's pretty amazing. But the doctor's saying, I want to check to see if there's a root or something further down, down you know, to, to make sure that that was out. But that was a baby step toward the power of God. We call it miracles. The Bible calls it in the Greek, the working of powers. And that... That's a baby step that happened. The woman with the issue of blood, 12 years, every kind of doctor spent all of her money, all of her earnings on, and nobody had an answer. Jesus comes along, and he doesn't even reach out consciously to touch her. She just said, if I could touch the prayer, the end of his prayer shawl, the sisiot of his talit. In the Hebrew, it would be, you know, the kanafim. She recognized him from Malachi chapter 4, first three verses, that the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wing, that when he came, he would be the Messiah because he would be the Jewish man with healing in the corners of his robe, his prayer shawl. And she said, in that crowd, being there illegal, illegally, if I can just grab hold of the, the, the hem of his garment, touch the, the corners of his prayer shawl, I'll be healed. Psychologically, he wasn't even aware of her presence. But because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, moved in cooperation with the Holy Spirit as a man, not as God, power went out of him and healed her. And he said that same thing can happen with us. As a woman and a man of God, it can happen with any one of us at any time. It was not his purpose to go to minister to this woman. He was headed to Jairus' house. He was on another mission. 
but his mission was interrupted momentarily with a healing. That can happen to us on your way to Kmart or Walmart in the parking lot. You're walking by. Somebody gets healed just because they're within 10 feet of you. You don't even know them. They don't know you. But suddenly their sinuses are totally cleared up when you're walking by. You may know it. You may not know it. But God will do things like that. The only hint for Jesus was that he, was that he felt virtue or power, if you please, had left him. He didn't know who it had gone into. It wasn't a word of knowledge. He turned around and said, who touched me? He had nothing to do with it. It was the partnership with the Holy Spirit and what was in him and on him, just like people stepped in the disciples' shadow and were healed or took handkerchiefs and aprons and the anointing was on it and healed them. Don't you know that if somebody can grab hold of, a, of an apron or a handkerchief and be healed, they should be able to grab hold of either one of us, any one of us, and be healed? God cares a lot more about us than he does aprons and handkerchiefs. So when we move beyond the baby stages and we start taking even baby steps in apprenticeship and training, what seems so big to us, eventually it won't matter the size because we're just used to moving and getting the results. That's what I'm here to teach us to do. And I hope you take advantage of that and learn because it's available. And we're in an era where we are ready for it. You're ready to be trained and to move in it. And so when it happens to you and things leave your own body, you'll get, begin to see it not as an every once in a while thing, but a way of life it becomes. It's an everyday thing. Don't you get tired of seeing sicknesses and diseases and it never gets cured? And people and things that are curable and they can recover from, they just live with it. Things like cacos, which is, well, I won't get into that. Well, there, I will say this, there's, there's a certain type of sickness and so forth that's demonic and it deals with depression and anxiety and per multiple personalities in the scripture that's kakos in the Greek a whole class of sicknesses and diseases that Jesus healed now you can go to counselors and so forth but it can happen right away in partnership with the Holy Spirit Jesus only had three years three and a half years he didn't have time to put people into a 10-year counseling program. They were just healed. And he didn't flow it in and flow it out. And all of that took place within a 30-mile radius of where he lived. That's where his ministry took place. So his reputation was strong. And if people didn't get healed, everybody would know it. So he had excellent results. The only time he didn't get the results he wanted was when he went home. And he, the scripture says he could not do many miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick folks because his own hometown didn't believe. They wouldn't cooperate with him. And sometimes in ministries it doesn't happen because people won't believe and cooperate with the Holy Spirit and with the men and women of God. And if that hindered Jesus, it will hinder you. Okay, so that's what we have in Christ. I took a while with that, but it's worth it. Because what's happening here, this can be the power center of this whole region. People can come here from massive churches that it's not happening at, and they can get something from here and take it back to those churches, and it can start happening there. But this is a place where it can happen and it starts because you have the right kind of leadership here and you have a bishop here who knows how to do this. And it can happen if we, if we are willing to, to train. So I'm prepared in physical body, I'm prepared in soul, and I'm prepared in spirit. So any way you, you cut it, whether it's physically, academically, or spiritually, I'm prepared for it. I'm qualified to do it. Some people would call that bragging. You can be foolish and say that if you want to. 
It's just simply speaking the truth. When you put in the time and you, the, and the years of study and training and so forth, you know what you're qualified to do. You don't, have, you, don't, you don't boast about it. You just tell people, you know what you're qualified to do, and you do it. And if you tell people you can do it, and they come and they receive from that, they can get those results. Why would you sit in a classroom with a professor that is not qualified to teach you? You get, you go and you get where people are qualified to give it. And then we study and we develop it. So that's what I'm here to do. Hallelujah. So praise the Lord. This is good. Would you give the Lord a clap offering of praise for who he is today and what he does in our lives? Pastor, would you, JR, would you come up? Hallelujah. You've heard people say, yeah, people say, my voice is soft. Yes.